And I also know there are a lot of IUL agents out there that are selling these things. And what I've noticed in my experience is that most IUL agents that are selling these actually mean well. They want to go out, they want to help people, they think they're doing right by people selling Index Universal Life, and they got into the business to help people, right? Like they're not trying to hurt people. I, I'm not one of these people that intrinsically thinks that people are bad and, and they're trying to deceive people. I think people just don't know what they don't know. And it was only because of my background and experience as a former head of business development for a Fortune 1000 IUL company, one of the top IUL companies in the country at the time, and now the top IUL company in the country. Um, but here's the deal. I'm gonna go through this. I'm gonna give a good breakdown, a good solid breakdown. And I've got my, my board here, um, and I'm super glad I just got this because of the fact that I'm gonna be able to give you a real insight. I'm gonna try to go as fast as possible, but I'm gonna warn you right now, this is going to be a long video. Hey, what's going on, Cashflow Hackers? It's Chris with Life 180, and for this video, we're gonna be doing something that is what I believe is really important, and that is going through a comprehensive analysis and comparison of whole life versus index universal life. And I'm gonna start off with an index universal life policy. And the reason I'm doing this is I had a subscriber reach out, they sent me a copy of a policy and, uh, or an illustration, not a policy, but an illustration. And in that illustration, I just kind of started looking at it and just full transparency, I'm not gonna get into details because this is not about them, but this is an illustration from, oh, from the laser fund people, right? So like this is, an illustration right here, you can see from Laser Financial. Uh, this is Utah. This is Doug Andrews Group. But that you know that, that really isn't the purpose of this because you know they're not they're not necessarily using this product every single time. And it doesn't matter if it is the Laser Fund Group or not. It is more a matter of the Pacific Index Accumulator Six and Index Universal Life in general. Understanding how they work, the moving parts. It doesn't matter. I've done a lot of videos recently on the Nationwide Accumulator 2020, the Symmetra Accumulator. Now we're looking at the Pacific Index Accumulator. I've done the Mutual of Omaha Accumulator. So if you wanna watch those, make sure you go to the Index Universal Life training playlist and get all the breakdowns of the policy reviews that I've done because you really need to understand the ins and outs and the moving parts. If you're looking to buy one of these policies, the one thing I can say is, this video is gonna be imperative for you to really understand the analysis. And, and I'm a big believer, if, like, if you put your money into something, you should 100% understand what you're putting your money into. I know too many people that are not in the right financial position to be getting these Index Universal Life policies, and they're being improperly sold these policies uh, for the wrong reasons, and they're not the right profile, and so on and so forth. And honestly, most people just don't understand what they're getting into and the disclaimers and what the risks are and so on and so forth. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through all this. And I also know there are a lot of IUL agents out there that are selling these things. And what I've noticed in my experience is that most IUL agents that are selling these actually mean well. They wanna go out, they wanna help people, they think they're doing right by people selling Index Universal Life, and they got into the business to help people, right? Like they're not trying to hurt people. I, I'm not one of these people that intrinsically thinks that people are bad and, and they're trying to deceive people. I think people just don't know what they don't know. And it was only because of my background and experience as a former head of business development for a Fortune 1000 IUL company, one of the top IUL companies in the country at the time, and now the top IUL company in the country. Um, but here's the deal. I'm gonna go through this, I'm gonna give a good breakdown, a good solid breakdown, and I've got my, my board here, um, and I'm super glad I just got this because of the fact that I'm gonna be able to give you a real insight. I'm gonna to try to go as fast as possible, but I'm gonna warn you right now, this is going to be a long video. I'm going to go really, really deep. I know a lot of times I do videos that are fast, 10 to 15 minutes, or even if you go to TikTok and follow me at Real Chris Kirkpatrick on TikTok, um, you'll see that I've got a lot of short videos. This is going to be a video that I'm going to do a deep dive analysis and then comparison of really understanding the nuanced differences between Index Universal Life and Whole Life Insurance. So let's get into this. I'm gonna make you stop looking at my ugly mug and we are gonna go into the Pack Life Accumulator 6. Now, once again, you can see this. Not gonna get into all the details here. I'm gonna, For the sake, because you can see here, that I have 56 slides. I don't know if you could see that down at the bottom, but I have 56 slides here. 
Um, we're on one of 56, and so this is gonna take a long time if I, because I have some slides that I need to spend a significant period of time on. So I'm gonna, and, and there's a lot of redundancy in this illustration, that, that's what I will say. In these IUL illustrations, they put the same thing in multiple times in different places for different reasons. Um, so when there's that redundancy, I'm gonna skip over it to get to the place where I know it's going to be um, you know, the most beneficial, where we can kind of make everything make sense the easiest. So choices for interest crediting potential. This is the only thing. It's basically saying you got options, right? In this, in this illustration, there's gonna be a lot of different options for indexing. Um, if you wanna read any of this, by the way, I, you know, I, like I said, even in areas where I'm not gonna stop and focus a lot, you could pause, you can read um, anytime. Obviously you're in control, you're driving the ship on your end of the equation in this. So you could pause anything and read anything, get into the details and uh, I'll do this and let you scroll a little bit. All right, there we go. So non-guaranteed pol policy value ledger. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because we're going to get to this. Now, um, this is where there's actually a ledger later on that gets into far greater detail, but you can see they're running this with a 5.21% interest rate, 100% of the allocation into the one year indexed account. So that is what they're focusing on. So those are the three things that I want you to understand looking at this slide. As I get into this, this will make more sense. And so uh, this is just, it's that I went through and made some notes, but it's the continuation of the ledger you see going to year 89 or 120. It's just a couple pages all kind of going down, showing the future. Now this is showing that you have an option A death benefit. Option A death benefit means you have a level death benefit uh, up until your age 61, level to age 61, and then after, or I mean, sorry, no, I'm wrong. It's increasing till age 61. My bad, I was just thinking backwards. And then it goes level after that. And so I'm gonna get into this. And, and show you more details on that, but that's what that page does. So now here you can see there's a uh, policy credits and enhanced performance factor. So this is basically a rider that you can buy. Um, this goes to show you all the benefits of it and it shows you can have up to $547,000 or 547,040 dollars in total bonus credits uh, overall, but the bottom line is um, this is just one of those things that, you know, so if, you, if you've if you gone and watched my other videos in 2015, Regulation AG49 came out, came out, you should look it up. Um, in response, the reason AG49 came out was because of the fact that insurance companies were uh, tired of the illicit sales practices building in uh, these crazy returns in the IUL policy. So they put in restrictions on how these could be illustrated. So at that point in time, companies came out with multipliers and other things to make the illustrations still perform really well. And, and the regulators did not foresee this happening. So in 2020, they came out with AG49A. So what happened then is all these companies said, okay, well, now the multipliers can't be used the same way. There's different rules. There's different ways we can do the arbitrage. And so what did they do? They had to come up with other ways, other riders, other uh, no cap indexes. That's a brand new thing in 2020. Uh, they did proprietary indexes. To proprietary indexes and to to uh their credit in this um iul pack life does not use a lot of proprietary stuff now i've done a lot of video uh videos on policy reviews recently uh reviewing like the nationwide accumulator 2020 the symmetra accumulator uh the mutual of omaha accumulator um, i think that's what that one's called but and and those um well, actually the Mutual of Omaha doesn't do a proprietary. They don't focus on the proprietary index as much, but those other two, Symmetra and the Nationwide, definitely have a deep leaning in the proprietary uh, component. And so at least to, to this policy's credit, they don't do that. But the, the important thing to understand here, when you look at these is it's the function of, when you look at the performance factor, I gotta go back to this. When you look at this performance factor, it's a rider, it costs money, it shows, it's a way to illustrate, and these illustrations are baked into the actual performance, but I'm gonna show you later, it shows that by doing this, it actually puts more risk in the policy, and it makes no sense. It actually goes against the, the, the intended purpose of what IULs were all about. Now, you could see here where it says, note, 
Uh, hold on, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna change my highlight color so you can see where I am focusing and we will go from there. So note, the enhanced performance factor rider charge is not the only charge associated with this life insurance policy. For a full breakdown of the charges associated with this life insurance policy, refer to, refer to the summary of charges and credits report. So it's important to understand that that is the case um, and you know, it is what it is. Like it's just, we'll, we'll check that out when we get there, okay? And so um, now we have, we're gonna go through here and it shows that you have fixed accounts, you have indexed accounts. It kind of gives you a breakdown of what they are. If you wanna read what these all are, you can do it. But I already showed you it's the, we have the, the one indexed account that we're really focusing on because that's where 100% of the money allocated is. So go back and pause that if you wanna see it. Now, here is the summary of policy charges and credits report. Now, for the sake of this, um, you know, you can see here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this red highlighter because I would already come through here once, uh, I guess on my own. Um, but you can see all assumptions are based on non-guaranteed values on otherwise stated. So meaning all of these areas, uh, non-guaranteed premium loads, administrative and rider charges, non-guaranteed coverage charge. These are all different charges that they have, non-guaranteed cost of insurance, right? These are all different ways right here that the company can change the levers and charge you extra fees in the policy that will reduce the performance of the policy. So you can see out of this, just these alone, the assumption is you got 72,000 going in, you got $9,000 in charges and that's the best case scenario. That's the current rate right now. Those can get worse from where we are right now, just on the non-guaranteed charges actually. And so actually, no, it's 14,000. It's sorry, I'm looking at it bad. Now you got interest credit and once again, not guaranteed because this is the policy values. Um, and so then it breaks it down uh, percentage of charges as, as a co uh, compared to the actual policy value. But the policy value is based on, once again, assumptions that are not guaranteed and all these levers, if they change these policy charges in the meantime, this is, this is kind of a manipulative uh, spreadsheet to me. And the reason I think this is manipulative is because, well, and I guess the reason, I'll put it this way, the reason this is frustrating to me is because as somebody who believes in whole life insurance as an asset to, to fulfill a certain role in your personal finances, and I'm gonna get into more of what I think that role will be later, but I can't stand it when IUL agents kind of try to position Index Universal Life as this more transparent product because of the fact that they show all the charges. But the bottom line is all these charges right here, guys, all of these charges are not guaranteed. They could be changed at any point in time. So the reason that the company has to put these charges on a sheet like this is to show you not all of these charges, but to show you this, to show you the fact that these are the charges currently, but we have to show you what they are right now because we can change them and kind of stick it to you at any point in time. And while there's no guarantee they're gonna raise the charges, I, I, I'm, a, I'm just a big believer history has a habit of repeating itself. And what I can tell you is it's the reason I did the Index Universal Life Challenge, the IUL Challenge, basically, calling agents out to say, hey, show me an illustration that's 10 years old or older and show me a current in force illustration that has outperformed the original illustration that you bought the that you sold the policy to. And I'm willing to pay an agent $1,000 if they can show me that happening once and I've had over 100,000 views and nobody has followed through with it. And to me, that's an astounding number. And since we just came through the greatest bull run of all time, you would think with the upside potential and the downside protection that everybody sells these things on, right? That we would be great because in this, you know, $77,000 is what it says. It says, hey, we put in 72, you should have 77 by year 10. So all I'm asking is like, it said you'd have 77 if this is what was sold, you know, 10 years ago. Show me a policy with $77,072 in it right now with the current enforced illustration. Show that to me and I'll give you a thousand bucks. And nobody's been able to do it. These things, and the reason is because these charges always change. They always have changed in the past. And if you're like me and you believe history has a habit of repeating itself, uh, it's gonna be no different moving forward from this point with any IUL illustration moving forward. So this is just the next page of those charges. Once again, I'm not gonna get into details because these, once again, the details of these charges don't really matter. 
um, what matters is, is, is the other fine print that we're going to get into that ultimately impact those charges. Um, so this is, okay, it's just, once again, we're continuing on that path. We got a lot of pages cause it's a big, it's a long, it's a long deal. So we're going to get through this. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. all right. So you could see, so it goes through, uh, non-guaranteed premium loads, right? So you can see premium load is a charge that is intended to reflect expense Pacific life bears related to the premiums, including certain federal, state, and local taxes. So they're basically passing their expenses on to you if they want to increase those load charges at any point in time, they can. Usually those are very front loaded. As you can see later in the policy, those, there are no load charges. Um, the non-guaranteed values shown reflect the illustrated rates illustrated interest rate assumptions that you have requested. These values will reflect the policy's alternate accumulated value if the 2% interest guarantee on the termination rider applies. Um, so I'm gonna get into what that means later. I wanna read these disclaimers though, even if I'm not gonna get into detail now because it will remind me to talk about it later as I go through it. So this column, uh, so number three, number three, number three right here, uh, administrative and rider charges. This column represents the total charges divided by the policy's end of year accumulated value. If a loan is illustrated, uh, the total insurance charges do not include any annual loan interest due. So uh, if a loan is illustrated, the total insurance charges do not include any loan interest due. So meaning there will be, by the way, there was no loan illustrated on this. And that actually, I'm glad I read it because it reminds me to say, if you are gonna run an illustration for an IUL, always make sure you run that illustration with loans in it because otherwise there are extra disclaimers that get thrown into there. And there's a reason IUL agents don't run them with illustrations because when you start uh, with, with loans taken from the illustration, I should say, because when you do that and, and the clients start reading the disclaimers and the risks that are associated with taking those loans and borrowing against your policy, it's pretty crazy. Um, a zero in the premium, this is a big one, a zero in the premium outlay column does not mean the policy is paid up. So it's, when you look at the premium outlay, it's important to understand, just because it shows zero there, it does not mean the policy is paid up it, it, because you can never purely pay up an IUL policy. And I'm gonna get into exactly what that means as we go here uh, when I get to the other uh, ledger portion, right? All right. Important info. So you can see here, this is the death benefit that we're talking. It's $153,001. Um, we're talking, they're paying annually. It's an option B uh, death benefit, which is increasing. And that will change to a level death benefit later in the policy when they stop funding it, which if you're going to do these uh, is the most common way that people try to design them. And so here we go. I'm going to zoom in just for sake of your legibility and being able to read what I'm and keep up with me. Uh, with what I'm reading. So this is an illustration only. An illustration is not intended to predict actual performance. So it's important to know uh, pretty much the only guaranteed in the ledgers and in, in the illustrations in this is that it will not perform as you see. Some policy elements such as policy charges and interest crediting rates are not guaranteed and may be referred to as current. So the lingo, understanding the lingo, the current means they're gonna go based on what it's currently being sold as now that's not guaranteed. They can move all of these current fees, right? They can change them to their benefit, to your detriment. Pacific Life Insurance Company reserves the right to change or modify any non-guaranteed or current elements. The right to modify these elements is not limited to a specific time or reason, but can, cannot be less favorable to you than the policy's guarantees. So what does that mean? That means the, um, the, the uh, insurance company has a right to modify at any point in time for any reason at their will. So they are in control. And one of the reasons I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of switch over the, the camera here for a second, because I think this is really important to understand. It's one of the biggest reasons and I'm, I'm gonna get into more detail later, but one of the biggest reasons I love whole life insurance is because if you're, everybody needs safe money, an emergency fund, an opportunity fund, I'm a big believer that the market is cyclical, it's not linear. Taking that volatility risk off the table by 
making sure you structure your finances in a way that gives you more security, liquidity, use and control of your money, more the guarantees, creates more opportunity. It makes it so you can behave as a better investor with everything else that you have going on. That part is amazing. And I love whole life insurance because it gives you more control of the outcome because it guarantees. You have a right, and I, once again, I said at the end of this, I'm gonna go through a whole life policy. In this video, I'm gonna show the nuance in the policy breakdowns of a whole life policy compared to an IUL and just the difference in the verbiage and how it's and why it's so important to understand that the reason you want a whole life policy is to control your money, A, have liquidity use and control of the safe, liquid, accessible capital that you need to have for emergency and opportunity. That is the first thing. And then the second component to it is you want to make sure you're working with a company that's going to preserve the purchasing power of your money. Think about it. If you want to keep your money liquid, accessible, controllable, most people think the only place you could do that is in a bank account. But let's face it, if you have your money in a bank account, you lose money long term to inflation. And so this is simply a bank account on steroids, not this, but a whole life policy is simply a bank account on steroids. It's going to give you other benefits and you're leveraging the life insurance company for what it does well, which is preserving the purchasing power of your money. That is what they've done for 170 to 180 years. That is what they're gonna to continue to do. That is what they are better at than any other financial institution in the world. And what happens is these people that sell IULs take this concept and they take all the benefits and they wanna market the benefits and they bastardize the concept and they try to package it and stuff like this. And, it, and ultimately, you don't get all the benefits that you think you're getting in a whole life you actually give up control, as I've just shown, based on the policy charges, and the insurance company has a control, whereas in a whole life policy, you are actually in control and you have the contractual right to contribute, and the insurance company has a contractual obligation to back you up. But here, you have the contractual obligation to keep funding a policy, even if it shows a zero. It doesn't mean you're not obligated to pay if the policy isn't self-funding. I've when I worked at National Life Group, I had to deal with more people that were getting lapse notices because they weren't properly funding their policies and they got too old, the cost of insurance got up and it created a lot of problems, even policies that are properly designed, right? And so um, let's, let's just get back into this a little bit. All right, so um, let's go. Let's keep going here. Policy value, values shown in this illustration are based on non-guaranteed policy charges and non-guaranteed crediting rates. That is a huge thing. Non-guaranteed policy charges and non-guaranteed crediting rates. Those, those two things, the charges can go up and the crediting rates can come down. And when you combine the two of those together, they don't have to be huge charges. It will make a huge difference in the long-term performance of your policy. And when you're talking about you're running these things on a 5.21% assumption for a crediting assumption, you don't need to reduce the performance by a lot. If you reduce the performance by 50 basis points, that's basically a 10% reduction in performance and you compound that out over time and it becomes catastrophic when you consider the fees in the policy will gobble it up. And it, and it really, really, really is uh, one of the most misunderstood and scary things about these policies, and you just need to understand it. So what this is showing is exactly what I was just talking about. You got increasing death benefit going to 29, and then when you stop funding the policy, when this person stops funding at 30, at year 30, uh, it goes to a level death benefit. The goal of that is to reduce the net amount at risk inside of the policy. And so theoretically, um, you know, it's supposed to be a really positive thing. Um, so I'm not going to get into all the details here, but this is just showing why annual renewable term inside of the policy. And I'm going to get into this later, but you can see the face amount of, of the ART. You're looking at $76,500, $501 uh, from year to 89. And the goal of this to, is, is the way that they kind of structured this in here, and you can read the details, is to help reduce your cost of insurance. And so, you know, it is what it is. But I'm not going to do a lot of time in here. This is showing you get a $7,200 premium from one to 29, then you go to zero. But once again, this zero is not um, meaning you don't have to pay anything. It is simply saying that for the illustrative purposes, you are not paying, right? And so that's, it's really, really, really important to understand this. Um, and so net premiums, this is important. Net premiums are paid initially 
uh, paid are initially allocated to a fixed account and subsequently transferred to the indexed accounts selected per your instructions. So you choose, the money goes into um, an account and it's important to understand how that works. Now I'm gonna get into after, I'm not gonna do it on this slide, but I'm gonna get into how that works and why it's so important to understand. So remember, I'm talking about this right now. Transferred from the fixed account, uh, transfers from the fixed account to the index accounts are processed on specific transfer dates, currently the 15th of every month. All right, so actually, no, I'm gonna do this now because I don't wanna lose my train of thought. So let's get into this. So it's important to understand that these are just UL platformed products with, uh, with an options strategy attached to it. Okay, so it's just a UL platform with options. And when you think about it like that, you really start to understand. We, I, I always tell people like, universal life basically was a failure. Variable universal life was a failure. Guaranteed universal life was basically a failure. Can't, companies are canceling them all around. Their market share went, spiked and then went way down because people regretted it. Now they, what do they do? They created IUL. They say upside potential, downside protection. Why do they say that? They don't say because of upside potential because of the market potential. They say upside potential and when you read, and one of the things that Mutual of Omaha did very, very well is they actually in their IUL uh, illustration said that the market upside potential, quote unquote, is not based on the market performance of the S&P. It's based on a comparison to the traditional UL. That is where the upside potential is designed. But uh, there is risk, right? There is risk. And so when you see this, you have to understand how do they create this? They create the, uh, the platform with an options budget. And so what, what do they do? They go out and they have to create, uh, let's, let's just say they have, um, they, you create options, um, you create an options budget. Let's just say that. How do you create an options budget? Well, you have a fixed account, right? So your fixed account in the policy. So every company has what's called a general fund. So the general fund will kick out a guaranteed return and, and the company manages that. And so uh, they'll have their yield, their guaranteed yield that they, they know they can earn. Let's call it 4% right now. So this will create the options budget. I'll call it the OB. The options budget is created. And then we have the options cost. This is really important to understand. Options cost. So the options cost will be whatever it will be. And so the options cost is also known as a hedging cost. Depending on what company you're looking at, they will write about it differently in all these illustrations. So it's important to understand that these are the variables that go into it. So now what will happen is if you have $10,000 of accumulated value, I'll just call AV in the policy, and the, what will happen is the company says, well, we're gonna put that money in our general fund, right? That's how we're describing it right here. We're gonna put that money in the general fund and we know we're gonna create $400 because 4% of 10, uh, of 10,000 is 400 bucks. So that is gonna be our options budget. The options budget then goes and buys the options, right? And then the performance of that option will then create the return. If the option doesn't come in and the market goes down, you lose the 400 bucks, your $10,000 is protected. That's how they give you the upside potential and the downside protection. But remember, if this option loses, the $10,000 net is, is, is protected, but because this 400 bucks is gone, all the cost of insurance, all the fees and everything come out of that $10,000. So if it doesn't take rocket science, if we go back in, in time here, let's just go back here. I'm gonna go back a couple slides and uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna go right here. No, we're gonna go one more. I just wanna get to where the charges are here, right? Okay, so when, when we look at this and we go to, this is the page where the charges are. So we look at the total charges in year 10. So let's just say year 10, you got $1,481 in total charges, okay? So let's go now, let's go back to where we were. And when we look at this, $1,421 in total charges. And so if we have a zero year, this is the crazy part. If we have a zero year in that scenario, we're gonna have all those charges that are coming out of the policy. So 1,421, that's almost a 14% loss, right? On, on, on the 10, well, no, it wouldn't be the seven, it would be, uh, the 77,000 in that scenario, but my, my guess is 
there's n uh, not going to be that much money in there based on past performance of how IULs traditional, traditionally do. So whatever $1,421 of a loss is on the 77,000 in that scenario would be the actual negative performance. Now, is it as bad? No, it's obviously better than losing 20% uh, in a portfolio. But the problem is when you do this, you're in business with a lot of people that sell this sell this as like an alternative to a 401k because why be in business with the government? Because they control your taxes and the flow and the control of the money. When you have your money in an IUL policy, you're basically su supplementing or trading out the, being in business with the government with being in business with these insurance companies. And like I just showed you over here, when we look at, oh, did I show you on the last slide? I guess I showed you on the last slide that ULs failed, guaranteed universal life's failed, variable universal life's failed. You're in business with companies that have a propensity and a proven track record showing you uh, that they're not going to perform um, the way that they say they're going to do, right? And so that's that's really important to understand. So I'm going to get back to where we were talking here. Okay, oh yeah, that's this is where we were. So um, so okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here. We're going to go to the next page and just keep this thing moving. All right. So here's the deal. When we look at this and we look at um, the, the, the policies and, and how this really works and, and like when we look at the crediting, they have uh, this, this fixed account and it's just 2.25 can be reduced to 2%. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it's 25 basis points. That's basically a 10% reduction in the performance of the policy. Now, not, not a huge deal because you're probably not going to keep your money in there. That's just an example of showing how little tweaks in these policies can can add up to a lot of money. Um, okay, the following information is on the segment life cycle, how oh, this is important, okay? So this is really important. I already had um, notes here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this out to you and then we're gonna go through in detail to my notes on the right. So when a new segment is created, the current segment components are locked in as a minimum guarantee for that segment's term, okay? So they put the floor in basically. One of the seg once the segment matures, it will be credited interest if applicable, if it qualifies. If your policy terminates before segment maturity, no index interest will be credited, credited above the segment guaranteed interest rate, which is credited daily prior to termination. At segment maturity, it may be reallocated to any account. If you don't specify a new account, it will create a new segment in the same index account, meaning it will just roll over. Each index account is projected at its own rate and the results are combined with the fixed account in this illustration, actual policy performance will be either more or less favorable than illustrated. So what is this showing? Each, each segmentation is independent, right? So meaning month to month, year to year annually for each independent deposit. So what does this do? This is what a lot of agents are doing. They're going, ooh, I've got clients that earned 60% in the policy, right? They've got like, I had clients that made 60% in one year, right? One year they made 60%. Like, oh my gosh, these things are so amazing. Well, it's easy. If you go back to March of 2020 when the Cerveza virus started, right? And we look at that and we, and we realize that, okay, what happened that month? The market just took a complete nosedive and went down 40%, right? So the market went down 40% and then, you know, hey, if we just take the stuff that was credited that month in 2021, or and, and we went from 2020, March to April, 2021, there was a 60% improvement in the market, right? So what happened? That's a huge improvement. And that's that one segment of, of products. And yeah, you have that credit, but that's like finding a needle in a haystack. It's like a unicorn event that, that happens. People are using these one little isolated incidents and they're trying to sell this whole concept on this one. Reality is you have, you're buying these because you're looking for a long-term solution. And you know, one of the things I've, I've started like trying to tell people is you can't utilize short-term or long-term, don't make a long-term mistake to try to solve a short-term uh, you know, problem. And, and this right here, we're, I know you're looking for security and guarantees and you think the, the indexing of this all works, but I think as you're seeing the fees and stuff in these policies, you, you realize um, you know, what is what here now. All right, this is really important. Now, I just, I, I just went through all the options, budgets, and the costs and, and how that works, and this is really important. I, I always tell people, it doesn't really matter 
all this talk and hype about the IUL, the, the cap rates, right? So you can see here, there's no cap right here. You got an 8% cap with a 3% guaranteed minimum, 10.5% cap with a 4% guaranteed minimum, 8.5% cap, 3% guaranteed minimum, 19% over two years. So that's basically, what is that, 9.5% with a 6%, which is a 3% um, per year on average minimum, right? So when you see these, like it doesn't really matter, 15% guaranteed growth over five years with no current cap because they know over a five year period it is like not that likely. But here's the deal. This is 15% over five years. Once again, a 3% guaranteed minimum. You can see over here also 110% participation rate. They can reduce it to 105, 150%, 140. These are all different moving parts. Now here's 100% guarantee. So a lot of people, what they're doing is they're saying, oh my gosh, this product is amazing. S&P, one year cap to cap or point to point index, no cap, 12 months. S&P 500, amazing, no cap, 100% guaranteed participation rate because the story was before people got into this, before regulation AG49A came out, companies didn't have no cap rate. So what happened? AG49 came out, 49A came out in 2020, like I wrote before, I'm just writing it here again so you can process it. They came out with no cap products. Why did they do that? Because what happened was they were looking at this and they were saying, well, classic policies say, well, we got 8% cap, 3% minimum. And, and we had a decade where uh, Pac Life back in 2010 had 16% caps. So they spent a decade dropping from 16 to 8%. Pretty crappy when you look at the, we're coming through the greatest bull run in the history of the market. Why is it that cap rates are going down in the greatest bull run of the market? Why are they underperforming illustrated rates in the greatest bull run of the market? Is because these aren't, the performance of these policies have nothing to do with the market. It has to do with the options budget. I'm gonna just say option budge and the options cost. I'm gonna just say opt cost, right? These are the number one and two. These are all that ultimately matter. And then ultimately the fees. That's the performance, right? So you don't control the options budget. The fixed market does. You don't control the options cost. The market does. You don't control the fees. The insurance company does. And the bottom line is these are all companies. Here's the deal. They like to sell these as the fact that you are with a company that's been doing this for a hundred plus years and you know has this experience and all these famous people like Walt Disney and JC Penney and all these people have used them. I got news for you, they didn't. They used whole life insurance and they would have never used these because of the fact that these you're giving up control. I don't know wealthy people that use these. All wealthy people I know use whole life insurance because of the fact that the number one attribute wealthy people look for in their money is control and you are giving up control in this. You have no control of the results in this. The insurance company does. And when it push comes to shove, when you have money with a company like Pack Life, their first objective is to guarantee their guaranteed products. They, they, it's to their company. If you buy it with a nationwide or, a, or like their or any other company, ultimately, it's effectively functions like a stock company. You don't get the benefits of a whole life company. They try to tell you that you have all these guarantees and the company's gonna have your back and they have this, this history of success doing this, but the reality is they're gonna utilize the fees and your IUL becomes a profit center for the company. So when push comes to shove, that's ultimately what happens. And when you look at all these, it doesn't matter. It does not matter right now with any of these indexes. I'm just gonna highlight the dickens out of this, right? It doesn't matter what the cap rate is. You have participation rates, you have cap rates, you have the reduction in guarantees, a reduction in the participation rates. But now when they create the no cap index here, I'm gonna go green. When they create this no cap index right here, what do they do? They don't, they, obviously if they put 100% guarantee on that, that means they can't reduce the cap. So it gets around the story that they were like being bombarded with by dropping this cap participation rate and the cap rate from 16 to 8%. So what do they do? They go, well, we're gonna create a no cap rate. We're gonna be able to sell it differently. But what do they do here? They go, well, now they have a threshold rate, eight and a half percent. So what is it? It's no cap on this, but guess what? The market has to do, the S&P index has to earn eight and a half percent before you get credited anything. Meaning if the market does, if the S&P does 10%, you're gonna get one and a half percent credited to your account. And if you look at this, this is their guarantee, 20%. That means they can raise this threshold rate to 20%, meaning if they do, 
the S&P has to earn 20% before you get anything credited to your account. To me, do I think they're ever gonna raise it that high? No, they'd be foolish uh, to do so, but even if they raise it to 10 or 11 or 12%, that will be catastrophic to the results of your policy. So I'm telling you, please, please, please be careful with this. And, and when you understand, actually before I go, I just gotta reiterate this, when you understand this concept that it's just the options, uh, you, got a, you got an options budget, you have the options cost, and then you have the fees. That is what goes into this policy that matters the most. And um, when you understand that that's what ultimately creates the results of this policy, that's what matters the most. And that, that's, that's really all that matters. It's what all that is gonna have an impact. The, this is showing the index historical look back rate. Okay, that's the index performance. Once again, this is all here. It doesn't really matter. It really doesn't. Like, because all the other fees can be changed, all the other charges can be changed. Uh, and, and the cap rates and the par rates and the spread charges and all these different things can be changed. The threshold rates can be changed. Um, <clears throat> all right, here we go. This table assumes an allocation of accumulated value uh, with no deductions for policy charges, withdrawals, or loans into the index accounts based on the index accounts, current caps, floors, participation rates, and accumulated value over a 25-year historical period to obtain a geometric mean. What does that mean? It basically means all of the the rates that you're seeing at this 5.21% assumption, that doesn't mean that's what you're earning. It means back out all the policy fees and all the charges of the performance after this. You're gonna get the accumulated value, you're gonna back that out, and that's ultimately what's gonna go into the policy. And so it's important to understand that. So, all right, let's get into the fun here. All right, so this is the ledger. This is ultimately when you go to an IUL agent, this is what they're gonna sell you on. This is, this is what they're gonna hype you up on. And so what I wanna do is I wanna break this down and let you understand what you're looking at. Okay, so <clears throat> it's not all bad, by the way. And uh, a lot of people who are whole life proponents like I am will oversell some things in a bad way on this that I think is, is not, um, not necessarily the most ethical way to kind of go about this. So I'm gonna try to do this in the least biased, most, most uh, transparent way that I possibly can. So um, once again, non-guaranteed hypothetical interest rates. It's important, important to understand this. Then we have a non-guaranteed alternative scale, alternate scale, which is 2.25%. And you can see here, this is the non-guaranteed alternate scale. So from here, to here, in between that box, that is the 2.25% assumption. And from here to here is the 5.21% assumption. And from here to here is the guaranteed. Now, a lot of people, a lot of whole life agents like to say, well, the guarantees in IULs suck, quite frankly. And so therefore, they're catastrophic. You don't wanna get one because listen, as you're funding it, you know, it, 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 you get down there. I'm gonna jump ahead just a slide just to kind of show you the guaranteed rates uh, just for a second. And you can see guaranteed in this, you're guaranteed to run. If, if you follow the guarantees, you're out of money at age 55. And obviously if you're buying this, you know, you're, that's not an attractive thing. I mean, you're looking at utilizing this for retirement income. So if at 85, even without taking income, cause this doesn't illustrate income. And so you're losing out all the disclaimers that I talked to you about before. So I can't even show you those, which I wish I could, but I can't, so I won't. But when you're looking at this, you know, that's obviously like a catastrophic event. You're not gonna do that. You're not gonna have to worry about this. So like for the sake of argument, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just say, don't even worry about this, honestly, because if this ever happens in an IUL even, you got a lot more things to worry about than what's going on inside of your financial plan. Uh, there's a lot more things happening in this world that you should be scared of. The reality is, and I don't think that's gonna happen by the way, I don't wanna be Mr. Scare Tactic. So the reality is, is this is ultimately what you should be looking at. If you look at right here and right here, these are the two options that are really comparative to each other, right? So. The, the current assumption is saying you're going to get to $77,072. The reality is you're probably going to be somewhere in between these. Let's call it 70,000, right? Let's go maybe, maybe 71,000, something like that. If history is any indication of what these things are actually going to perform at, if the market does well, if the market even does halfway well, which I'm actually kind of worried the next three, four, five years are going to be pretty rough, then it's going to be, 
you know, somewhere in the, in the, let's just call it the 71K is what this would actually perform at. And, and once again, I'm not sitting here telling you, I think it's going to perform at 71, uh, from a, from a perspective of this is what you should bank on. But I'm just simply saying it's expectation management, right? It's like, it may be better than this. It, it may be worse than this. If it lies here, okay, whatever, that's fine. Um, but it, I'm a big believer if you're expecting this, and you end up with this, well, you're in trouble, but maybe you're not because of the time frame and the horizon or whatever. But if you're, it'll certainly make a difference as we go down through this, right? Because uh, actually, let's just do that. Because when we see year 20, right? This little difference between 77 and 65 doesn't seem huge, but now even the next 10 years, the difference between these because of the fees, because we're talking about what do we have here? This 7,200 bucks, remember, you can never pay up your insurance. So what's happening is every single year, you have this annual renewable term, right? You have to pay this annual renewable term. So cost of insurance goes up and up and up because you're paying for your term at the current age that you're at right here, right? And so those costs go up. And so if you don't have as much cash in or if the index doesn't perform well, and there's, I pretty much guarantee you there's no way you're gonna have positive performance every single year. So you're gonna have years that it doesn't perform well, the costs go up. That's why these illustrations are just deceptive at best. Um, that it's not gonna perform that way. And so once again, now we're talking about, okay, 20 years out, we're talking about it's probably gonna be somewhere in the middle. So maybe it's 180K, something like that. Once again, I don't know, but I'm just kind of throwing things out there. Maybe it's 190K, I don't know. But like, it, it, once again, expectations. Now this is where it gets, it gets really important because when we start getting into retirement, let's just use 65 as the target age right here, right? So as we look at 65, this is where uh, things start to get real because um, the value here is 283, the value here is 536, right? Once again, it's gonna be somewhere in the middle, but if you're looking to take retirement income out of this and you're leveraging this for retirement income and you're going based on expectations around 536,000 and they ran illustrations for you, they're gonna run the illustrations based on this 536,000 number. I'm not saying it's even gonna be this 283, but let's say it's 350. Let's say it's 400, something of that nature. Either of these two, it's not gonna be this. And so if you have to take, you know, 70% of the income you thought you were gonna take, my guess is that's, that it's gonna put you behind what your plans are, right? Like if you're like the average American family, that's probably where you're gonna wind up. And that doesn't account for the fact that when you start taking policy loans out of this, and unfortunately, I don't have the disclaimers to show you because they didn't run Ill, uh, income in this illustration, but it, it's, it's just, you have to understand that all of these moving parts will have an impact on this. And if you're buying this for retirement income, these are the things that you need to think about. Now, once again, I don't think it will be even this bad. I think if you run this thing at a four to four and a half percent assumption, because the overriding principle of this is that the, if the general fund for the insurance company is earning 4%, right? How could they get you 5.21% in this through this indexing strategy? Because if, if the indexing strategy works so well, the insurance company themselves is having a hard time getting 4%. If it was really that safe to get this 5.21%, I always kind of tell people, common sense goes a long way in this situation. Why wouldn't they take their own money and put it into this if it were that safe to get this extra, because this is over 30% better of a return than they're getting in their general fund. So if, if they could increase their general fund portfolio performance you know, by 30%, don't you think that's something they would do? Well, they would if it worked that way and if it were as safe and, and guaranteed as it's being sold to you as, but it's not that way, so they don't do it. That's, the insurance company doesn't do this for themselves because it doesn't work the way that your agent is selling it to you. That's why this is more risky than, they, you know, than, than anybody's telling you, and that's why I'm so passionate about helping people understand it. And once again, no, no income illustrated. And you can see that at, at uh, age 85 here with a guarantee, it runs out of money. Once again, I'm not worried about that. But we can see here, without even taking income, right? This is the crazy part. Without even taking income, you're looking at this 422,000 there versus 1.45 million. So it's a million dollars of difference of accumulated value based on assumptions. And so this is without even taking loans. And so let's just split the difference and meet in the middle, right? Like 
take that out, you know, add 500 grand, you like got 900 K instead of 1.4 million. Let's say you do that. If here's the deal, a lot of people are like, Oh, 900 K great deal. Well, do you realize what you need? Like from a purchasing power perspective, $400,000 or $900,000, uh, 55 years from now with 3% inflation. If you go to the rule of 72 divided by three, that means what is that? 20, 40, 20, it's 24. So every 24 years it doubles. So 55, 54 divided by 24 is two point change. So let's just call it factor of two. So you're going to multiply 208,000 twice. So 208,000 times two, is 416,000, 416 times two, 834 or uh, 32,000, okay? Okay, 832,000, what do you know? I got to about 900,000 here, we got a couple extra years. Wow, that's ironic, I hadn't done this before. So what did I tell you earlier in the video? Life insurance companies are good at one thing, it's preserving the purchasing power of your money. If you think that you're going to outdo this uh, with through any other means, um, you're, you, the insurance company is going to do for you what they do for themselves, and they're not going to be able to do any more than that based on how they these things function. I always tell people, and I'm gonna I got to get on video here and do this here. So I always tell people, what's the upside? What's the downside? Can I live with the downside? Now you have a little more upside. And I'm gonna show you a whole life policy later that's gonna be pretty comparable to this, right? It's gonna be pretty comparable to that. It's gonna fall in that area. Do you lose the ability to have the potential to earn the 1.45 million? Yup, but you also have in this the potential to end up at the 420,000, where in the whole life you don't. And so that's why I'm a big believer, take your risk outside of the insurance policy, not inside of the insurance policy, because that's not what insurance companies do. And this is just going further and uh, showing even more. Um, oh yeah, and so here, I, I actually did this math earlier later in there. I hadn't done it um, on the previous policy, but at a 3% inflation rate, $208,000 today at year 89 is, $2,887,861. And right here in this non-guaranteed alternate rate is 815,000. Granted, the current rate is 763,000. It's ridiculous. It's never going to happen. Um, um, like, you know, it's just, once again, I, I, I shouldn't say never because I should just say if history is any indication of future results, uh, these policies are never going to perform as uh, as illustrated, and so it is what it is. So insurance coverage will cease in year 55 based on current assumptions. You can see here, uh, insurance coverage will remain in force at least through year 89 on non-guaranteed alternate scale. Okay, so this is just telling you what you have. A zero in the premium. Oh, this is important right here. Okay, so a zero in the premium outlay column does not mean the policy is paid up. That is one of the most important things you can understand. It does not mean that there are not charges going. And if you stop paying, it's important to understand that those charges will compound against you if the policy is not funded properly. And when you take loans against the policy for retirement income at a time where when you're 65, let's say, like say you're taking income at 70 years old, your costs of insurance are going up dramatically, right? Because you're paying annual renewable term and at 70 years old, that annual renewable term gets really, really expensive. I'm telling you, it does. It's, and so if you have a negative year in the index at that age and you have a 4% policy loan on it, all these things work against you and I'm telling you, this is why I see policy after policy after policy lapse and implode and have all these problems in retirement. So it's important to understand that. All right, let's move on. Um, what do I have here? Uh, counter to AG49A. Oh yeah, so what do we have here? So what do we, we have here is the enhanced performance factor rider that, that we talked about earlier. So this kind of just shows the charges and, and like what this looks like. But ultimately what happened is, you know, um, these guys, how do I put this? Pacific Life uh, 
in 2015 was one of the biggest companies when it came to creating multipliers in their policies to enhance their performance as a counter to AG49. Now, what happened is in 2020, they came out with AG49A to make their counters to AG49 not as efficient. So what they did here is they created this enhanced performance factor rider to be a counter to the counter, so <laughs> if that makes sense. So they're just, they're playing games and they're trying to do these things so they illustrate better. But the bottom line is it's just all illustration wars. Bobby Samuelson says it the best, Life Product Review. If you haven't checked him out, go check him out. If you're looking at buying or uh, any of this stuff, go to lifeproductreview.com. Uh, nothing in that for me. It's like a hundred bucks a month, um, but I just, I love Bobby. I think he's one of the best industry minds in the, in, in the world. He understands this product stuff better than anybody. Um, when you do this stuff, you can see here, it says straight up the rider's impact on the policy's accumulated value may be positive or negative or negative. So in what world, because it increases the risk. So in what world do we want to increase risk in a life insurance policy? The answer is never, right? And it's just the way it works. And so I'm not gonna go into all the details of how all this works um, because it would be probably a 40 minute video just explaining it. Just understand that this is really just illustration tactics and it doesn't matter what this looks like. I mean, there's a cost to everything. Riders are not designed for you to be more profitable. They're dealing with the options budget the way that they're dealing with it. They have the options budget, they have the options cost, and they have the insurance cost and all that stuff. That is what is gonna be the biggest factor of the pricing and the performance of this policy. All this other stuff is smoke and mirrors. Premier Living Benefits Rider, <clears throat> this is fantastic. As you see this, this is really good because we have the Premier Living Benefits Rider. Um, I mean, this is, this is the, one of the good things about IULs. Uh, the problem that I have with these living benefit riders is that, yeah, they do have a payment for chronic illness um, and it's fantastic. Um, but the bottom line is they're sold as if they're the only ones that do that. And I'm gonna show you later that whole life insurance offers the same thing. And so um, you can see there's the no lapse riders, but you can see the short term no lapse rider is there. Um, but if you discontinue paying um, the short-term no-lapse uh, guaranteed rider uh, or take loans or withdrawals from the policy, the no-lapse feature may terminate before you, uh, the gar guaranteed duration. So meaning if you utilize this policy for loans, if you want to utilize it for infinite banking or get real estate or anything like that, you're actually getting rid of one of the most beneficial riders in the policy. So uh, don't do that not, is basically they're saying if you do, it's on you. Uh, death proceeds. I just kind of like highlighted some of the tax um, focuses here. It's important to understand this stuff. Understand section 7702. Um, they just changed the rules. They're actually very beneficial to both whole life insurance and IUL because you can put more cash in with less death benefit. That works for all permanent insurance. That's actually a really beneficial thing. Uh, section 101A1, that is showing the benefits, the tax benefits of actually having the life insurance and why it passes on in a tax advantageous tax-free way in most scenarios to your heirs, that is really good. Tax-free income, withdrawals do not exceed tax basis, generally uh, premiums paid minus prior withdrawals. So here's the deal, I would never take withdrawals from this policy, uh, that's not the point of this video, it's, I've got a lot of other videos on why you would always wanna use policy loans. However, taking policy loans from an IUL uh, increases exponentially the risk inside of the policy. Um, however, I would never take withdrawals. If you're going to do withdrawals, you might as well just surrender the policy for the most part. A lot of times people would do withdrawals up to cost basis. You could do that and then start doing policy loans. But once again, you're going to run into challenges if you do that. Policy remains in force until the death. Any outstanding policy debt at time of lapse or surrender that exceeds a tax basis will be subject to tax. So it's basically saying you can get taxed on this if uh, you don't handle it the right way. So you can see here, this is not necessarily the most maximum efficient policy. Um, you got a $7,200 uh, premium. You can put up to 9,069 in the first seven years per year without mecking the policy, without creating a modified endowment contract and losing the tax benefits. <clears throat> that is what it is. I gotta get a drink here. I've been talking for too long. All right, <clears throat> I feel better. So, um, so this is what it is. Now, th this, is, this is normal, it's, a, it's okay. It, it's gonna be really hard to find uh, a, an illustration that's perfectly designed with that. 
uh, where you actually are funding up to the 9,069. The one thing that you always wanna make sure that you look in, in an IUL policy is the target premium. And the weird part on this one is I have not been able to find target premium anywhere. They talk about the guideline level premium, the seven pay. Uh, there's no place in here showing the target premium. And ultimately the target premium is what the insurance agent is getting paid on. And I'm hoping, even though I, I did a once over on this once before, as I go through this, I will see it because I'm not seeing it. And that's a little uh, concerning to me. Um, <clears throat> overview, neither the policy, here we go. Neither the policy nor the index account directly invest in the stock market or the S&P, okay? Or, or any of these indexes, right? So they list off all the indexes. Historical performance of any index should not be considered a representation of past or future performance of the index accounts. Because once again, they have to say this because the performance of the index has really nothing to do with how your policy is gonna be cr uh, credited because what do we have? We have the options budget and options cost, right? Those, and then insurance, and then we'll just call it fees, right? Inside the policy. That's what matters. That's what's gonna dictate the performance of the policy. So that they have to say this, right? It has nothing to do with it because all the other participation rates, spread charges, all this stuff are ultimately what are gonna impact the crediting charges. So they have to be uh, really clear on, on how the fact that market performance isn't really gonna have direct impact on your policy. Uh, and the past performance is not indicative. Um, actual index account crediting rates under this life insurance policy may be greater or less than the performance showed from the indexes, right? So they, they, it just goes to show they're in control, right? And once again, it goes back to what I was saying before, you wanna be in control of all the moving parts that you can be in control of and you are not in control of them here. And so <clears throat> when you look at this, what do we have here? A uh, numeric summary. So it's just showing illustrated 5.21, 687,000. You know, so if you were to submit this, uh, the, the applicant, applicant would have to sign there. The producer would have to sign there. This is the illustration that would have to be submitted um, with the application for life insurance. And this is what I'm saying in the IUL challenges. Show me the IUL illustration that was submitted with the policy submission when they applied for the insurance and then show me 10 years later an Enforce illustration that has outperformed the illustration that I just showed you. And you could see in this one, it was $77,000 after 10 years with $72,000 contributed to it. And not one person with 100,000 views has been able to show me that happening. Now, here we go. All right, how's everybody doing? You need a breather? I know I, I should have done this should have done this live. It would have been really, really fun. Um, but anyway, here we are. We're not doing it live. And um, whatever. It is what it is. Maybe I'll do another, another video. But now let's get into, this is a company called Lafayette Life Insurance. I love this. It's the Patriot product. Oh, my daughter is here. I got to say hi to my daughter real quick. Hold on. Hey, you. I wasn't, I wasn't to school. Okay, cool. Hey, I'm filming a video. School. You did go to school. No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Mommy didn't drop me off. Oh, okay. I love you. I gotta get back to filming, okay? But Daddy, what? I didn't go to school. Okay, baby. Daddy. I'm I'm filming, baby. No, I'm not done. She Daddy. just I'm Daddy. recording. Daddy. I know. Yes. I just went all the way home. You did? Yeah. Good job, baby. All right. Cool. How much longer do you need? Half hour. All right, I'm back. <clears throat> that was fun, sorry about the delay. Um, so here's the deal. I'm gonna go through this illustration. I'm gonna try to break everything down. You're gonna notice that this illustration is infinitely more transparent from the perspective of what you see is what you get. It's not nearly as long. They don't have to have as many pages. And that is because it's a much more simple um, product and it's a much more transparent product. And so. Well, uh, let me just get going here and we will get into this. Um, <clears throat> so I took the liberty of getting one of my guys to create an illustration that was funded very similarly, right? So you can see here, annual premium is $71.99. So basically it's $7,200 a year. Um, we said during the first 33 years, 
premiums are paid in cash out of pocket. 34 through 43, premiums are paid by the applicant through the current div dividends and surrender of paid up addition. So they're utilizing, we're doing what we call using a, a premium offset. So we're not having to, starting in year 34 here, we're not paying the premiums out of pocket. We're utilizing the performance of the policy to actually pay the premiums through the dividends that we're, we're doing. And it's just, a, you don't have to do that. You can keep paying it out of pocket. You'll see when I get there. That's important to understand. Um, the initial seven pay test here, the MEC is 8,106. So we're putting 7,200 in. The IUL was actually over $9,000. This is just over 8,000. This is the maximum premium that you can pay per year during the first seven years without causing the policy to be classified as a MEC. Now the same with IUL as whole life. If you overfund it during this period of time, it can have an impact on how much you can fund the policy after. Um, sometimes it will help the policy be more, more efficient to get that uh, as much money into the policy early. It's gonna be more efficient. It's gonna grow in a more uh, favorable way for you. Um, but it doesn't necessarily, if, if you fund it all that way, it can have a negative impact on your ability to continue funding at higher levels later in the policy. So just know that that's a risk that you take on when you do that. Now, other important information. Uh, it makes several timing assumptions, okay? So premiums are paid exactly when due. So basically, make your premium payments, pay your bills, right? Like, look at this as a making strategic deposits on systematic basis. Um, loans and loan repayments occur at the end of each policy year. So the one thing to understand is when we look at this and we look at the dividend crediting, it's always assuming the end of the year. Paid up additions at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the next policy year, the dollar value of the dividend is used to purchase paid up additional insurance. Remember, you can never have paid up insurance in an IUL. This is paid up additional insurance. The amount of paid up additional insurance purchased is included in the non-guaranteed values of the tabular, tabular detail because the dividends are not guaranteed and we're utilizing dividends to buy paid up insurance. And so if this policy has a 2%, this is what I was saying before, guaranteed and it's a total of 5.2% credited right now, right? So that means there's a 3.2% dividend effectively, right? And so what they're doing is they're utilizing this part to buy paid up additions, right? So it's, it's important to understand. I think when you see the ledger, you're going to go through and you're going to understand it and you're going to see it. It'll make sense. And so, uh, this illustration assumes that all premiums are paid in cash each year until the insured gains 65 um, when they hit that age. Um, if the dividends are lower than assumed, um, you know, it will have an impact on the cash value, right? No out-of-pocket premiums are paid in the years uh, in which the premium outlay is zero. If it shows the premium outlay zero, you don't have to come out of pocket for anything. It will be... Uh, well, I'll show it to you. It'll make sense. That's why I love this because the, the, the ledger is a much more clear thing to understand. All right, level paid up additions. Um, so this is basically the riders. See, there's not a lot of riders on this. I use, we used a 30-year term rider because the 30-year-old 30, 30 uh, going through a $75,000 term rider going through uh, that falls away after 30 years of the term being there, at which case you'll see how it impacts the funding and I'll show it to you when we get there. While active, you may pay additional premiums for this rider to buy paid up additional insurance, right? So um, subject to a maximum annual premium of 5,040. So basically the reason we do this term rider is to give you the ability to contribute that much more in cash because that money is gonna be much more efficient. Now, if you do this, the good news is you're not required to put that 5,000 in. You can see the minimum annual premium for this rider is 500 in the first year. So year one, you got to put at least 500 in the policy to do that. And, and then year two and beyond until the rider, um, until the term rider expires, you have to put in at least 120 per year. So the beautiful part about that is it creates a lot of flexibility in the policy. So this 5,040 bucks here, you're not required to pay that. You have the flexibility to pay it. Now in an IUL policy, yeah, you have flexibility. And a lot of people say one of the benefits of IUL is the flexibility compared to whole life. Or right here, you could see if, if in an IUL, 
I have that 5,000, I'm just gonna use the same, like rough numbers that are the same, and I don't pay it, well, guess what? That's an extra expense in the IUL policy that's gonna have a negative impact. If in a whole life policy, I'm not gonna have as much death benefit because I'm not gonna buy, so if I don't pay that $5,000, what happens is I just have less PUAs, right? Less PUAs, which means I have less paid up insurance, so the cash value will be a little less. We're gonna be contributing less to it, but it's not gonna put the policy at risk of imploding as long as I meet the guarantees, uh, you know, the minimum funding mechanism of the policy. Whereas uh, with, with Index Universal Life, that it's just not, it's not as straightforward um, because you can fund it properly, so to speak. You can fund it at the suggested target levels and there's still no guarantee it's not gonna lapse on you. And that's, that's the biggest thing to understand there is if you fund a whole life at its, at, at its base levels, because whole life uses different terminology. We use base on whole life and target with index universal life. Um, when we fund it at the base levels in whole life, you're never gonna run out of money. Now, here's the deal, uh, or you'll never lapse the policy, I should say. Um, that's the best terminology to use there. So here you can see accelerated benefit, death benefit rider, right? So this is cool. I'm gonna go through in detail later uh, and show the breakdown of what the benefit is for the accelerated death benefit rider on this policy. Once again, a lot of people say IULs are the only policies that have it, but you can see right there, it's here, and uh, it's important to understand. Illustrated scale, <clears throat> this is a big thing to understand. I'm gonna get another drink of water. I've been talking so long. So the illustrated scale here is basically showing that we are going on current assumptions. Remember, so IULs work on current assumptions. And, and so I gotta I got do this, and I'm sorry if you feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but I, I, it's so important that you understand this. One of the reasons that I like whole life in this market is that we look at the fixed account. So when you are a whole life policy holder, you are participating in the profits like Lafayette Life Insurance is a participating mutually held life insurance company. So you are participating in the profits of the life insurance company. That's how you get the dividend, right? So in this scenario, think about it this way. They're giving 5.2% based on the current fixed market. The life insurance companies invest in bonds, whether it's corporate, treasury bonds, stuff like that. And they have, actually I've done some videos on this, go check it out, that shows the breakdown of a mutual fund portfolio. It's like a pie and like that much of it is bonds. And then we have little slivers of other things that give a little upside, a little diversification, but mostly they fix, they stay in the fixed market. So over the next 10 years, I believe that we're coming in, um, we're coming into a, a, an increase in the fixed rate environment. And what is that gonna do? That's going to drive up the dividend rate. Um, and if you look historically, back in the 80s, dividend rates were 14% for a lot of these whole life companies. So they've been coming down, they've been coming down, they've been coming down, and, and now we are at the 5.2%. But as interest rates go up, I'm not saying they're gonna get back to 14% by any stretch, but if they get to seven to 8%, I think that's actually kind of a realistic expectation that we will get to. That's why I'm so bullish on whole life insurance. I've been in this industry for 12, 13 years now. One of the things that's always been the case for me is I've been working in this declining interest rate environment, this flat quantitative easing world where the performance of the general funds have gone down, which have made it so like, listen, general funds for the whole life, income, whole life insurance companies are 4%, but because they have long-term bonds, they still have... 30 year old bonds from the 80s and 90s, or they did in, the, in 2010, those were maturing and that was putting a lot of downward pressure on the general fund. So now the general fund's at 4%, well guess what, it's gonna go up. And if the general fund goes up, the dividend's gonna go up and you as a shareholder essentially with the participating companies is gonna participate with a higher dividend. That's the way it goes. Now with the, with the general fund being 4% in a IUL policy, this is just, all this is, is the options budget. That's all it is. You really get nothing aside from just the options budget. That's, that's what you get. And you have all the other variables. And so if the options costs go up, you don't really benefit anything. You, like, cause there's more volatility. You're not gonna get the same return. In an increasing interest rate environment, the S&P performance is gonna be down. And so even if, 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 if you get a higher cap rate, or if the cap rate doesn't go down, well, if the market's performing like crap, 
You're, you're not gonna, uh, like, it, it just makes no sense. So when I look at this, I'm excited about the fact that I, well, there's no crystal ball and there's no guarantees. For the first time ever, I can say with a lot of confidence and with a lot of excitement that I think whole life policies are gonna actually outperform uh, what they're currently showing on the illustration and what I'm gonna show you. And once again, I'm gonna be really clear about that. So this is the paid up additions thing here that I talked about before. Premium outlay means out of pocket payment that is reflective. Surrender, uh, you, you don't wanna do that. Um, you, like it's same as IUL, you, you never wanna surrender your premium in these things if you don't have to. Sometimes you just run into situations where you have to, but you wanna make sure you build these with enough flexibility so you don't have to. That's, and then they have a 50% illustrated scale uh, that'll show what happens with 50% of dividend performance and that is actually right here. You can see here, $355,000 at age 70 if it performs at half the dividend scale um, for for everything. And so, um, you know, it, it, it just, whatever. That, that I, in order to do that, I'll tell you that the dividend rates in 100, with this company in over 120 years, dividend rates are pretty much the lowest they've been. And in order for them to, to do this, we'd have to see an unprecedented rate, uh, a, a decrease in rates that, you know, that we've never seen. And so I just don't see that happening personally. Um, you know, it's just really important to understand that um, I, I just, yeah, I, I, the bottom line is I just don't see that happening. Uh, that the, if, if it happens, obviously we, I, I believe we have a lot more things to worry about um, than than what's going on in these policies. And here's what I'll say to this, is that yes, there's a lot of wealthy people that utilize whole life insurance, like Ben Bernanke, I'm gonna just write initials, Ben Bernanke, um, Janet Yellen. Um, we have, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the Congress that 54, Barry Dyke did this, this awesome book called The Pirates of Manhattan, and it shows 54, 54 Congress people confirmed to have money in insurance products like this. So the elite of the elite, the bottom line is they have money, I mean, in inside of these whole life policy companies, right? So if they're with mutually held companies, I'm gonna give my money, rather than keep it in a bank with FDIC, I'm gonna put it in these whole life policy companies in these mutually held companies because they're gonna manage it with their billions of dollars and they're gonna preserve the purchasing power of my capital. And if we run into a situation where we're at risk of losing the world's reserve currency, I want them to manage that risk for me. I want them to manage that transition for me because they've been doing it since 1840, right? So if these companies have been doing it since 1840, you know there've been three versions of the dollar, go look it up, right? And three versions of the dollar. They've gone through the Civil War, the Great Depression, uh, you know, all the world wars, all everything that's been going on, and yet nothing has been able to collapse these companies. They've been around, they've been steadfast. It's because they don't speculate, they don't leverage, they do what works and they, they manage risk better than any other financial institution in the world. In, in 2008, when, you know, when all these banks failed, there were 567 banks that failed, I think. It was something in that range not one life insurance company failed like that. Not one mutually held life insurance company failed. And so when you, when you come at it through that lens, you realize like, wow, why would I put my money anywhere else if I need liquid accessible capital in an emergency fund for an opportunity fund? This is just, that's why I say whole life insurance, not IUL because of all the things I've been saying to you, right? So now let's look at the, the comparative thing here. This is the illustration. You see how much cleaner this is? There's not a lot of moving parts. We have a couple things here. We have the guaranteed and we have the non-guaranteed assumption with 100% dividend scale. Now, what does that mean? This is going on the 5.2% assumption, which is the guaranteed and the dividend combined. And this is guaranteed, meaning it's 2% period. Okay. Right. I, I underlined it, but I actually crossed it out. So I'll circle it. Okay. So <clears throat> when we look at this here, I'm going to He's blue here. So when we look at this, this has got 76,000 bucks. Now this is not guaranteed, remember? But it's based on this 5.2% and based on, so you have to make, this is, this, I'm not trying to tell you this is better than IUL, okay? Now this is where I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of take a step backwards and I'm gonna say this is not better than IUL. 
Um, and I'm not trying to convince you that it is better. I'm simply a believer, and this is one of the passion points that drives me, is I'm a believer that your investment strategy should be in alignment with your beliefs and values, period. That's just what I believe. Your investment strategy and philosophy, your savings, how you're planning for your future, it better be in alignment with your values and your beliefs. And so I'm not sitting here and telling you that you should do this or you know, the IUL had $77,000 at that point in time. Now, I will tell you that I think history has a habit of repeating itself, that the odds of this 77,000 are pretty low. But this is based on a 5.2% assumption with whole life, right? So if dividend rates go up because the fixed market goes up and you're actually a business partner with the company rather than a profit center for the company, if that's the case and we got 76,000 here, well, that's not even guaranteed. And I'm gonna be really, really transparent. That's not guaranteed, but I think the odds of this actually outperforming or hitting that number because these are pretty much all time low dividend rates, like the odds of this happening are infinitely greater than this happening. And when you look at the downside, it's 76, 680 compared to 77, is really in change, maybe a thousand dollars less, not much, but what's the upside? What's the downside? Can I live with the downside? Remember this was 65 on the bottom at the, at the uh, not even the bottom end, but the, the kind of alternative rate, alternate rate. And, and when you look at um, at the fact that this could actually perform better. Now, uh, could, could the IUL perform better? I suppose technically in, in some unicorn world where unicorns fly and, and they exist and there's Pegasus and all that stuff, they probably could as well. Um, but I, it just, it's never happened. IULs have been around since 1997. There's never been a 10 year period where they've all performed better than what they were sold at. It's been a constant declining performance schedule. So. I'm, maybe I'm just more conservative. And so maybe that's why I love whole life insurance because it's in alignment with what my values are. And so once again, if it's not you, then, then go do IUL. But if your values are kind of more in alignment with what mine are and you believe you, you want to take a risk, you believe the best asset in the world is you and not this policy. And the only value the policy has to you is how you leverage it to go create wealth. And that's one of the reasons I wrote my book, Cash Flow Hacking. And if you haven't gotten it, Go to cash, um, uh, cash flow hacking book. It's long. Dot com. Get it for eight ninety five. Just pay for the shipping and handling. You can go to Amazon. Get it for twenty bucks. If you go to that website, you get it for free. I'll put a link in the description below. You can check that out as well. But but here's the deal. You go down here, um, and and you can see. That, uh, that down here, the, oh, let's see here, I'm gonna use this color, the 361,000 at year 29, so this is when we stop funding it in the IUL, um, is year 29, it has 361,000. So in the IUL, once again, it has 417,000 cash value. So is that better? Yeah, it is. But my experience tells me that I have zero belief, personally, even though it's illustrated, I have zero belief that it's actually gonna get there. Is it the upside potential? Sure, I, I, it has some upside potential, but here's the deal. You have $570,000 of death benefit. You, you, that's actually in the IUL. So over here, you actually have about oh, $70,000 more almost of death benefit, right? Which is, which is kind of cool, right? And this is a lot, a high, high portion of this is all completely paid up. Whereas uh, you know, the net amount at risk is the 570 minus 417 that gap will never really truly be paid up. Uh, you know, the, you just, it's not gonna happen. And so we're looking at this 461,000. Once again, because of all the story that I'm talking about, I mean, God only knows what's gonna happen, right? We got a long period, we got 29 years. I don't know. We've been through a lot of stuff in the past 30 years, right? The interest rate environment has changed, economies, we're gonna have these boom bust cycles. We're probably gonna have a boom bust cycle, you know, three, four times during this period of time, right? Like during those, in those blue slashes there, those could be boom bust cycles for all we know, right? Like we don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know what the interest rates are gonna do, but I do know historically speaking, interest rates are at all time low rates. And if we have to make up for them, they're gonna go up in the next decade. And so we're gonna have a period of time where this really outperforms. And so I actually believe that this will do better than what's illustrated and this will do worse now, who knows? I mean, once again, this is just my opinion. And I, obviously I have a very strong 
and what I would consider to be a very educated opinion about this, but um, it is what it is. Now you can see, oop, let me go back actually, because I want to show you this, because remember I was talking about the premium offset. So, so here's the deal, and, 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 and I don't want to like uh, uh, omit anything here or, or skip over anything either, so, and I get kind of excited sometimes. So, so you can see here, here's the, here's the guaranteed column, or this is the premium column, this is what we're paying in premium. And then um, here's the net cash value. This is the guarantee. This is the worst case scenario that if you fund this policy properly, this is the worst case scenario. Remember, what's the upside? What's the downside? Can I live with the downside? Now, I'm just looking at this from the perspective of, you know, 72, 140, like you're, you're, all, you're guaranteed if you just fund this to come out ahead uh, from what you've put into it. If you leverage this and you use it to buy real estate or invest in crypto or get into a business or anything of that nature, it's just going to get better and better and better. And so that's a, that's a really positive thing. But on top of that, you're looking at the fact that, you know, from a guaranteed perspective, if you compare this to an IUL, it's like it's, it's night and day. It's a different world, right? Now, starting at this point in time, you can see here, where do I have this? The premium outlay, uh, 2160. So I actually have this funded... How did they fund this? They funded this actually uh, all the way through 65 and then starting at 66 here, you can see the zero with a star, that's the premium offset years. So they're utilizing dividends. So out of the dividends right here, the 4, 12, 490, they're utilizing 2160 of that to pay the premium. So this 2160 is actually getting paid, but you don't have to pay for it out of pocket you can if you want to, but we're utilizing the dividends to pay for it. And so then at 75, it's fully paid up on a guaranteed basis. Um, at 76, it's fully paid up on a guaranteed basis. 245,000 in net cash value, $304,000 death benefit. That's the guaranteed side, but the net cash value, this is the current side, because it's the same in whole life as it is with IUL. You have $680,000 of cash value with 842, but once again, once again, I will tell you that it is my very, very strong belief and opinion that this is actually going to be higher CV than illustrated, right? And I think when you understand all the moving parts that I've been talking about and you use some deductive reasoning, you can come to that conclusion. Now, I'm not gonna tell you to ever bank on it being higher, right? I would always tell you to go out and leverage this money to get the real estate, the crypto, Take the risk outside of the policy. That's where you're gonna maximize your returns. This is just simply a holding vehicle for your capital. It's a storage tank for your wealth to create opportunity. That's what this policy is all about. That is what this is designed to do for you. And if you're thinking about it in any other capacity and leveraging it in any other way or having any other expectations, I'm gonna tell you, you need to rethink your thinking or you need to not do this. That's, that's, that's all I can say. Now, this 680,000, while, while, while I'm saying I think it's gonna be higher, um, you know, I'm saying this is a pretty comfortable number to bank on. And even if, even if it's a little lower than that, it's not gonna be much lower than that because once again, at 5.2% or at the lowest dividend rates that we've ever had, and the only way it's gonna go lower is if the fixed market stays low inflation uh, going up and if where we are right now, I mean, everything is pointing and I've been saying this for years now that we're going this direction and finally, the market is finally turning to kind of show uh, that we are headed this direction. So the timing is now to get to kind of lock this in and be able to take advantage of it ultimately. Um, and so once again, it's, it's, I always say, what's the upside? What's the downside? Can I live with the downside? This is the downside. This is not even the upside. This is the potential. This, but the upside could be higher than this. And maybe let's say it even goes to 600K and that's kind of where you're thinking about. Um, are you comfortable with that? Can you leverage that for these other things to make your life a little better? If you can, uh, if you can visualize that and that's how you want to use it, you should never, ever, 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 ever do an index universal life policy. You should always be looking at a whole life policy. And this is why I say you cannot utilize infinite banking with index universal life. You cannot implement infinite banking with index universal life. You must use a whole life insurance policy because of the function of how they kind of help your money function like a bank because you have the guarantees and you have the predictable nature to it and the control. Remember, this is, remember I said you have up to the, the $5,040 PUA? 
So this is, this is, that is a contractual right for you. It's not an obligation. So out of this 7,200, oh, 5,040 here. So out of the 7,200, you minus that 5,040 out and that is what you're obligated to pay. So like, what is, what is that? That's uh, 2,000, oh gosh, I'm not, you know, yeah. So it's like 1,760, I think. That is all you're obligated to pay on this every single year. Is that set? So you have the spread anywhere in between 7,200 and 1,760. Actually, it'd be plus 120 because of the rider. So for the PUA rider, so 1,760, so it's 1,880. So anywhere between 7,200 and 1,880 is ultimately what you're going to pay in this policy. That you can, you, can, you can fund it anywhere in between there. And guess what? No matter what you do in that, you're never putting yourself at, at risk. And so it's putting you in control of how you want to handle it. Now, is it going to, is it going to have all the money here if you fund it less? Is it going to have this $680,000 if you fund it less? No, it's not. But you're not ever going to put yourself at risk of losing your money. You're not going to put it at risk of lapsing the policy simply based on the way you fund it as long as you can manage funding it properly. So <clears throat> this just goes down through and it shows all the way through 89 because like all life insurance companies, you can see it's uh, going down here. It is it like they, they, the mortality tables goes all the way to age 121. So just like the last one, it's 89 years of the policy because the policy holder is there. Um, $2,892. Now, if you go back and you remember what I did with the uh, purchasing power on the IUL to show as an example, it was about 2 million. 800,000 or 800,000 um, uh, is what the purchasing power is. So if you put in 208,000 of total premium, total, I'll just put TP for total premium. And then you looked at what is the purchasing power of that money. This is what inflation does to us at 3%. 89 years from now, we're going to need 200, 2,800,000 because with the rule of 72, every 24 years, that 208 doubles, right? It's important to understand. So it goes from 208 to then year 24. It goes, it goes to 416. Ah, 416. And then you go to year 48, and it goes to 832. And then you go to year 72. 72 and it goes to 1,664,000, right? And then you add in another, cause 89, you got 17 years more and it brings you to about 2.8 million, right? And so that's where, what do life insurance companies do? They preserve the purchasing power of your money based on inflation. If inflation gets worse, that's why I love that's why I love doing whole life insurance here, guys. Like, and I, I cannot overly express this. And I know this is a long video. And I, if you're watching me still, I mean, God bless you. You're, it shows how into this you are. Um, but if we have inflation that gets out of control and all this stuff, all we're doing is we're, par we're partnering with the insurance company and we're saying, hey, listen, you're really good at this. I'm not going to keep my safe, guaranteed, liquid, accessible capital in a bank. I'm going to put it here and then I'm going to go take risks elsewhere. But the money that I have liquid, you guys do this. You've done it for 170 years. Just go take care of my money. Make sure I don't lose the value of my money like I would in a bank. That's really all it comes down to. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't think it, think it more than that. It, it doesn't need to be more complicated than that. And that's, that's all I can say. So when you go from that perspective, that's really important to understand. We'll go from there. What else do we have here? <laughs> um, Oh yeah, so, so this is just going to show actually, here, can you see this? Uh, let me make sure uh, it sees. Now, you know what, I'm gonna uh, go back to this so you can see the full thing here. So you can see this, this just breaks down um, the whole premium. So just with all the charges, with everything, with the term rider, because I didn't bring the term rider expense into it uh, when I was doing the breakdown before, so it's important to understand this, um, that the minimum required is 2439. And you, so you, anywhere in between this is how you can fund this policy. And that is ultimately uh, what it comes down to, right? So uh, for the first year one through seven, you could do up to five, 5,040. 
And after that, you can do 4,880. Uh, and uh, that is what it is. So it's really, uh, it's, I mean, it really is just clean, guys. This is why I love this because it's such a simpler conversation. And rather than me trying to bait you and, and convince you about all these moving parts, you got to get underwritten for $171,000 of insurance. Rather than me trying to convince you about how awesome this is and what, what, what great rates of return this is going to do, I'm just a big believer. Everybody needs an emergency fund. Everybody needs an opportunity fund. I'm a big believer in investing for cash flow. That's why I wrote my book, Cash Flow Hacking. Take risk outside of the policy, but you need the opportunity. You need the emergency. You need to make sure you have that safe, liquid, accessible capital. You need to make sure you're saving before you invest, but you save with the intent of investing. So if you're going to do that, put the money in a whole life policy. Don't put it in an IUL and take a risk inside of that. Go take risk in real estate. Go take risk in things that you understand like a business. Invest in yourself. Go invest money, borrow against it, get in a mastermind, surround yourself with people. That's one of the best things I've done in my life is taking money and putting it into myself, right? Like because my ability to create cash flow and other things at 40 years old is going to give a better return on investment than anything else that I could do in the market, especially at this point in time, right? And so that that that's what I can say here. I don't want to convince you that life insurance companies are going to be better than they actually are. You need to understand that, right? And you need to make sure that your financial strategy is in alignment with what your values and your beliefs are. And so really, really, really important stuff here. Um, and then finally, um, the accelerated death benefit report. So I'm going to show this one more time here. Um, this is really, really good stuff. So a lot of IUL agents will say that there's not accelerated benefit riders inside of um, whole life insurance, but you see chronic terminal values. Look at this. So lump sums based on the year, it changes based on the year, how much is available. Um, but you can see the lump sums uh, if you become terminally ill, listen, I have, this is a big thing for me. My father-in-law was diagnosed at 72 years old. Imagine if he did this just hypothetically, he did it about nine years ago and we, we got a whole different thing here, but, uh, um, he was a, he, he was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer, found a seven and a half centimeter tumor on his pancreas that had spread to his liver, <clears throat> was given a three year life sentence, uh, death sentence, I suppose. And, um, the crazy part was the, the doctors wouldn't, the oncologists wouldn't give them chemo. They wouldn't give them radiation. We weren't going to do it anyway, but I'm a big believer in uh, controlling your own medical directive. And so he had that happen when he was 74, right? And imagine if he had $716,000 of a lump sum that when told that he could utilize this money uh, to utilize it for alternative medical treatments in whatever way he saw fit, right? Like that was, he was in control because most companies aren't going to go out and allow you to do uh, alternative treatments and fly to Mexico city and go to Atlanta and get supplements out of Mexico that the United States won't even let you sell or won't even let you buy. Um, and you know, stuff of that nature, like nobody's going to allow you to do that. Um, and so, uh, what happens here is he was able to go on and I'll tell you, this happened in November of 2020. My father-in-law is still alive playing golf four days a week. Right now, actually, he just had foot surgery, but so he's not playing golf for the next couple of months and it's 115 degrees here in Phoenix right now. But the bottom line is he's still alive and was playing up until a couple of weeks ago, golf four days a week, and he'll be back to it. And the doctors have told him because of the treatments, he's got everything so under control, they don't even see him dying because of pancreatic cancer and the tumor and all these things. They see him dying of other causes of, of old age and stuff because he's got it under control. The oncologists are looking at him like he's some sort of unicorn and they were like a test case study. And so you could see here the, the benefits of the accelerated benefit riders here are, are just so awesome. The chronic riders, if you get diabetes, if you have something else that happens where it qualifies you for chronic, if you need anything, this is just a great supplemental coverage. I, you know, that, that, that is, is just better than honestly anything else you can find in my opinion. So it goes like, this is the biggest no brainer. That's why I'm saying like, if you got to keep your money in a bank account or keep your money in a whole life policy, why the heck would you ever keep your money in a bank account where you're losing money to inflation? You're going to check the inflation box. You're going to check the ancillary benefits. You're going to get all these benefits that come with it. You're going to have more control of your money, more control of the growth. You know, you're going to, you're going to have a self-completing plan, right? With a whole life policy, it's going to be a self-completing plan because let's go back to this, right? If you, you have all this life insurance, I don't know. Well, I, I got to go back here. Let me, let me find the, uh, 
let me find this policy. I just want, this is the last thing I want to say, and then I'm going to end this for you. Cause I know this is, uh, this is long. And I, you know, like I said, I honor you for hanging in there. Cause I know this isn't necessarily the sexiest and most fun stuff unless you're a nerd like me. Um, <clears throat> but the bottom line is I look at this as a self-completing plan because let's say year five, you, you know, let's say you were saving this, you need the safe, liquid, accessible capital. You need to be saving money. We all, we can all agree to agree that we need an emergency fund. You could save this $7,200 a year in an emergency fund. What does that look like? That's 14, 20, 35, 36,000 bucks, right? So you put $36,000 into a savings account. Let's say you did that. Well, in this, you're going to have a little less. You're going to have 32,850 at that stage. But if you die, it's self-completing your family's going to get 195,684 bucks, right? So it's, it's one of those things. We know we need this safety fund. We know we need this emergency fund, but the problem is we don't think about like, what is the risk to our family? I know I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a father. I got a wife and three kids and I have a life that I want to create for my family, right? I have a legacy that I want to create. That's really important to me. Maybe it's more important to me than some other people, but it's really important to me. So I want to make sure if anything happens to me, my plan self completes anywhere along the way. And that, you know, they're going to get more than what I'm putting in because I know I need to save this anyway. So if I'm going to do it, I'm going to, I'm going to create leverage, right? That's, that's all a whole life policy is, is leverage. And so it's a way to allow your dollars to perform more than one function in your life. And, uh, that's what it comes down to. So, uh, if you have any questions, I know there's a lot of them probably, um, I'm going on an hour and 40 minutes now and, uh, it's really just, I, I hope, uh, you found value in this. Uh, if you have any questions, comment in the comment section below. If you haven't already, make sure and you're still here. I hope to God you've hit the subscribe button by now. Um, make sure you hit the bell that we get notified uh, every time I launch a new video. And as always, until next video, have a blessed and inspirational day. We'll talk soon. See ya.